Welcome everyone to Almost Cancelled, I am Peter and today I am going to be talking about The Handmaid's Tale Season 4 Episode 2, it's called Nightshade. So full spoilers for the episode as always. First things first, I will say that I generally think this was a better episode than the first episode of the season. It was a bit more focused, had a kind of a clear goal, uh, there was a couple of particularly good moments in there I think. Um, I'm not going to keep saying this because it's, it's going to be redundant and be repetitive if I keep doing it, but I'll, I'll just make it clear, while I'm much more positive on this, if we do get to a point where I think it's back up to the standard of at its peak, you know, season one, I will make that very clear, because I, I don't, but this was better than last episode, I have less problems with this by far, uh, and I would say I typically was into most of what it was doing. Um. Certainly, in theory, I, I respected everything that it was trying to do with, with its various plots. Um, the main plot, of course, will, will, which will, you know, the Jin plot, I suppose, is that some guardians do come by the farm. Uh, Esther's able to sort of talk them out of getting involved immediately, um, but they're going to come back later. And it means that the, the Jin and the handmaids are going to have to move. They're going to have to go to a new safe house. So they kind of try to arrange that, but that leads to June meeting uh, someone who coordinates for May Day. Uh, the credits say her name is Daisy, but uh, I, I was, for me, I was just kind of like, I recognize her. Who is this? And it was a Supergirl from Smallville, of, of all things, is what I recognize her from. But we meet her, uh, which turns out to be another Jezebel's uh, location. Makes sense that other cities, other locations have this, have this too. And, you know, she, she's a fairly broken character from the first glimpse. You know, she's in the hoodie, she's hiding her face. Um, it's all very... And a part, part of this might just be hiding the conversation because she's doing things that she's not supposed to, but um, it definitely feels uh, like she's in a dark place, uh, as you would expect. And this episode is June sort of determined to try and get... Get some... Basically, perform some more like, acts against Gilead. She, she realizes upon hearing that there's like three or four commanders who are hanging out at the Jezebel's place for a couple of days before they go to Chicago because that's where the big push and the big, like, you know, all, all the military stuff, all the, the planning that's going into this big offensive is all happening. And while strategically there is that, but as Alma, uh, well, I think it's Alma, it says later, you know, do you actually, you know, need to do this, or is this just about killing a bunch of commanders? And she kind of just agrees that it's that too. Um, so that, that becomes kind of her focus of the episode. Uh, she doesn't know how. Uh, they crack some jokes about her just going in like Rambo, uh, about maybe building a bomb. And ultimately, it's actually Esther's uh, little scheme she's got going with the, the commander of the household, which is that she's been slowly poisoning him. Uh, with small doses, and June's like, hey, do you want to teach me how to make big batches of that <laughs> so it's more potent? And I got a little chuckle out of the have you been poisoning him? Uh, th that that was a neat little line. Uh, and the, the build up to some of this stuff, obviously the, some of the, the things that Handmaid's Tale typically does very well, and it, it almost feels needless to even point them out anymore, but you know, things like the trip in the van to the Jezebel's place, June sort of watching knowing she can be caught at any point. Uh, obviously, we have a slightly different scenario here where we have this guardian who's on her side. Uh, the episode actually did a pretty decent job later on of making me like him. Uh, he has a sort of sweet little moment where he says, I'm not leaving you on your own, which basically just confirmed that he was probably about to die. And sure enough, he did. But I was like, oh, you made me kind of like him. It was kind of sweet that he's willing to sort of stick by her. And then, yeah, he dies for, for it within about a minute. Which, you know, it would have been a nice swear if he didn't. It'd be a nice swear if he did end up being like a the sort of more permanent comrade. But, you know, I, I get I get what it's doing. I, I get the, the impact that it's going for. I thought that moment in particular was was, was very good. Uh, but yeah, so effectively that's what happens. June goes out back into the Jezebels, dishes out this poison. Uh, the, you know, Daisy and the others who are there uh, distribute it throughout uh, all the commanders. And June even makes sure there's some there for the aunt who's there, who's particularly uh, mean. So, uh, you know, and she walks out with her, her, her head held high, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a solid moment. Um, I think if there's a critique to be made is that, you know, we've kind of done this dance 
a little bit where you know they'll get you know she'll get a little victory and she'll walk out with some music playing i feel like we've seen that kind of scene before but and it almost all signaled that hey we're about to have something really sad or bad happen <laughs> because we're, we're we're being too happy there's too much happiness right now and it's the handmaid's tale they have to have misery again within seconds so even the drive home before before the the suspicion that something's wrong with the house as they approach it uh, which I, I do like that June recognised there was something up. It was kind of a nice little thing that she's getting good at spotting when there is something wrong. That her her eye for spotting danger. Uh, I don't want to say she's like a spy or like a secret agent or anything like that. But the idea that her instincts when there's something dangerous going on or a combat situation or or an, you know an ambush in this case. I like that that's the sort of thing that's naturally developing over time. Uh, a little bit. Um. So I thought that was because it wasn't like super over the top. It wasn't like a she. She just sort of had a gut feeling that something looked a bit suspicious. I actually thought the place was on fire the the first time it cut to it. All the orange lights in the house were so strong that I actually thought it was on fire for a brief second, and it wasn't. But I thought that. So by that, I, th- I thought the gunshot itself that took out the 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 good guardian, and then the reveal of Nick who. It's one of those great things where there's a, a potential double meaning here where Nick says, where are the handmaids? Which you can read Tim either being literal with it and that he's just asking that because he has to ask it, uh, or he's he's specifically f- saying that as quickly as possible to let June know that they got out, that they'd already left, that, that, that they didn't find anyone else. Because we know they were planning to leave and maybe they were, you know, uh, already to go they heard some trouble was coming so they moved right away that that's very although that does leave the question because when june and the other guardian are walking up to the house they do like step on some shell casings uh which makes me question what were they shooting at if everyone was already gone uh that's a little bit weird i'm sure i'm sure there's an explanation but it, it, it felt a little bit weird like that was my first thought when it, it, you know he said that because oh wait they already left they're already gone i mean maybe they they sort of caught a glimpse of them but why wouldn't they chase them what how did they get away if if they did get a glimpse of them? It's a little bit weird, but uh, other than that, no, I I like this. I like all the, the the key parts here, and because we've not seen June and Nick together for a while, there's a little bit of a different vibe to it, especially given his position these days and how higher up the food chain he is, and you know coming in close, saying that he'll keep her alive, which is what ultimately makes her take her hand off the gun because she you know she goes down for the gun that the guardian had, and. As soon as she goes for it, all the laser sights are pointing at her. I, again, so I thought the actual execution of this moment, in terms of the the beats of the the suspense and all, all the little things where it, it went from gunshot of him, the shock to that, going for the gun, all the laser sights, out walks Nick, out of focus, and he comes into focus. And honestly, I think he had to say that. He had to say, I'm going to try and keep you alive, uh, after confirming that the handmaids got away, because... If you're June in this situation, given what you've done, you've flown a plane of kids out of the country, given that you've just helped murder a bunch of commanders who aren't even technically dead yet, maybe. Maybe it won't take till middle of the night or the morning before they actually die. But she's behind that too. Honestly, the best thing she can do for herself is force them to just riddle her with bullets because it's a quick death versus what they're going to put her through uh, in the coming time. And it's only because Nick gives her this this shred of hope of being an ally of being someone who's going to look out for her that she does take her hand off the gun but she has to make the choice and you know it's a, it doesn't it's not a quick choice either you know, the tear comes down the face she has to really think about it and then eventually you know we end with the shot of them standing around her uh but most of this is, is pretty solid stuff like i said i've got the one little plot nitpick of why what were they shooting at if everyone was already gone but other than that I can't really fault the final five minutes of the show. It's it's very well executed. Uh, performances, you know, as per usual, are, are really good. And it played on the d- dynamic of these two characters we've not seen in a while. A, to make it feel fresh, but it used their history to inform why, char- why June specifically makes a decision in this scene. And it's, you know, it's one of the things I always talk about with long-form drama is that we end up with this, like, justified shorthand and when i say justified i mean because it doesn't feel they're taking shortcuts but it's a shorthand at the vern because we know what characters mean to other characters we know their past and we know the context of what things mean to them between each other 
and you can build a shorthand in, in a show's ongoing narrative over time. Uh, and that's what this was. It was it was like a quick shorthand of how to get to this choice in her head. And we can see it all play out on her face. We can understand it. And it all makes sense. So ending ending was very, very solid. Uh, and we also know that Esther wanted to go with them. Esther really broke down when she heard that June was leaving. And June, perhaps a decision she wouldn't have made before, but she's kind of like... This is the season so far, based on episode one and episode two, where she wants to kill these commanders, and this choice she makes with Esther to just say, you know what, yeah, you can come with us. You can come on the run with us, we'll, we'll kill your commander, and we'll, we'll go on the run. This feels like uh, June's YOLO season, <laughs> where she's just saying, sod this, F it all, I'm just gonna go crazy, and I'm just gonna do all the things that I would logically talk myself out of before. And maybe that'll make things really entertaining as we go on. But she has been held. She's captured now, though. Like, we don't get a lot. I mean, maybe we'll return to her being, like, out on the run and running around and doing things. I, I mean, if anything, if I have, like, a, a speculative complaint, and this is purely speculation, is that I might feel in the coming episodes that we should have had more of her doing, you know, malicious style things and assassinations and, and whatever. Uh, outside of the system and dodging people and whatnot and, and being on the run. Maybe we should have more of that before she got captured again, because maybe that does feel a bit quick, because it's only been two episodes, really. But maybe, I don't know, but maybe at the end, I, I don't know, maybe we'll shake, things will shake up. Yeah, you know, I was really worried about the June and Esther stuff last episode. It didn't bother me that much this episode. The way it came up, at least it changed the dynamic that I really didn't like in the last episode up until that ending. And even though I didn't like the ending, uh, because they're in a different place. You know, the one awkward moment with Esther this episode where she walks in and she's like, y'all stop talking when I walked in. I don't like that. Um, the dynamic was very different, I think, compared to the last episode. And, like, June knows she can go talk to her now, and they, they like, it's not presented as a threat so much th as that they all know she's a child who's been working through some really awful trauma. And it, you know, it just, it, it, it came across very differently now. Uh, and I appreciate that. But of course, this whole plot is completely upended uh, where we were going with everything. But we have this team of handmaids and Esther uh, and another safe house now, presumably. Um, so, you know, maybe they'll somehow break June out or something. I don't know. We'll find out, I guess. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. It's, it's funny, like, may maybe the times where, like, I'm... I'm at my lowest with an episode like this, which is pretty solid overall. Like, I really don't have a whole lot to complain about, other than just there's moments where it feels like it's doing something that's been doing since season one. And, you know, stuff like walking out in slow motion to the song playing uh, at the Jezebels, uh, to a lesser extent, you know, the hiding in the van, because that's still very good. Like, that's still really well done. It's just that we've seen her sneaking around and, like, being in these dangerous situations where she can be caught at any point. Uh, which, which is why the, the change in status quo is so different, which is why I think I, I'm i I'm definitely feeling better about the, the you know, the, the Waterford and uh, Serena stuff, because them being in Canada, them being in prison and going to this trial, I wouldn't say that the individual scenes of this episode are as good as last episode. Uh, that's not to say there's not some highlights in here. Uh, obviously, the big bombshell at the end is that Serena's pregnant, which I thought was a wonderful, darkly ironic ending to the subplot of this episode because it's just like this show. Even this character who is relatively villainous to us a lot of the time, she's had her moments of redemption here or there, although she kind of always squanders them after the fact. Uh, that became kind of a running joke almost uh, between me and Connor uh, once we got to like season two and three. Was that oh, does she's they're up, they're somehow making me think she's a human being again? And oh no, she's just done something awful. I think the the dark irony of you know her whole thing, the reason why in part that she even wrote the book that led to Gilead, the reason why she was on board with everything was be, was the desire to have children and that, you know, people couldn't have children. And she was inclusive in this of not being able to have children uh, between her and her husband. And then she gets this news at the worst possible point, which is after her and her husband have been so completely separated. Because, I mean, this episode is kind of like a last uh, ditch effort to kind of reconciliate, reconciliate, reconciliate in some way. 
uh, because they tried to like tell her, hey, your best course of after a medical exam, your best course of action is to build up a history that he's been abusive, and that will sort of change the charges against you. Or they'll make people see see you favorably, and that you were acting out of defense and trauma and so on and so on. And she doesn't actually want to do it. Serena, for, you know, for, I mean, her deluded devotion to this stupid man or, or whatever, but she doesn't actually, because technically she didn't see it as abuse. And uh, outside of the rules of Gilead, he was actually not abusive to her, which is a, is a, you know, a can of worms that I don't even want to try and analyze in terms of, like, that. I don't want to even analyze that comment. But, She's, you know, she kind of says, no, that wasn't really the case, so I don't really want to say that. But she says, hey, let me talk to Fred. And because she points out a flaw as well for, uh, was it Mark, the, uh, the, the dude here, who's, uh, you know, her, like, contact, who's, like, in this plot. Yeah, Mark. He, he, he you know, she points out something to him that she's a, her, his key witness against everything that Fred has done. And now that their key witness is also on trial for something heinous which kind of hurts their case against him. And it's actually kind of a good point, <laughs> which he does acknowledge, which is why he agrees to let her go see him. And we have this scene between them where she tries to talk sense to, to Waterford. She still believes in the man that he was before Gilead and believes she can still tap into that. And, you know, he just kind of shows that, he, no, he's, he is Gilead Fred, like completely th through and through. He still is. He, he still... Like, he has no interest in letting her have a free life with uh, Nicole. He even says that he gave her too much freedom in Gilead, uh, which felt particularly vicious. Um, it was actually kind of cathartic to hear Serena actually finally say that once he got a taste of power, she essentially got left behind in his mind, as, as far as equality goes, as far as anything like that goes. Uh, but she used that, that phrase, once you got a taste of power. Uh, and how much that changed who he was and, and the world she was in. Um, that, was, that was just like a really kind of self-enlightening moment for her, I think, and something that I, I, I can appreciate. Uh, but then she's given this news at the end. So, you know, he leaves. He's like, yeah, I'm never giving you your freedom with, with this baby that you... She's no, no more your daughter than she is mine. And he's got, he's also kind of got a point there, in, in a sense, because uh, this, this is actually June and Nick's daughter which is a whole other, uh, you know, kettle of fish. But, yeah, so, uh, th this plot is far, like, th the choice to remove the Waterfords from Gilead and put them into Canada, is it's actually almost funny that every main character almost at this point, except June, has got out of Gilead. <laughs> I mean, not Nick, I guess, or Alma, but, you know, everyone else has escaped. Myra, Emily, um, Rita, the Waterfronts, <laughs> everyone's escaped Gilead, but Jen. <laughs> I don't even, <laughs> I'm just having this thought right now, which is why it's so funny to me. But, yeah, so, I mean, but taking them out of Gilead really, it, 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 it meant that with, for some of these characters, things have really changed. And the status quo has changed, and it feels much more fresh because of that. And I think one of the things that felt the most stale last season probably was uh, Serena and Fred and their interaction, uh, their interactions with June. You know, I, I remember the whole middle of the season where they, they tried to you know do the big speech uh, on TV and all that, and I remember that being kind of some of the lower points from some of their character stuff. Uh, I don't remember exactly what we said or or what we felt specifically. It's been a while now, but I I, I do remember that, that lingering feeling. And I think these two characters being moved away into a completely new situation where they're, they're, where they're being forced to go through changes, where they were actually progressing and having uh, realizations or having confrontations, all these things that they're finally getting to have and, and move their stories forward is a really, really good thing. Uh, speaking of Canada, we did get to meet some of the other characters again this episode. Uh, we got Emily, we got Myra, we got a bit of Luke. Uh, we got Rita. Rita and Luke speaking at a fundraiser uh, for all the charity efforts uh, that go into helping out these kids that have came across, as well as just, I guess, in general, refugees from Gilead and things of that nature. Uh, and they're talking about June. There's a, lot, there's a couple of... This is, more than anything, this is Moira's story. 
Uh, it keeps cutting back to Moyer's reaction in this first scene, and a- as it goes on, there's a lot of um, there's, there's a lot of like her, even though interweaves between all the other characters that are in Canada. It, it's very much about her, uh, you know. You know, we get to see more of her job here that she's helping these kids and the adoptions and things like that. And she's working with Emily, and she's got and Moira's got a new girlfriend. Emily feels a bit awkward, you know, being around it. Uh, partly just because it's third wheel and they're being affectionate, but also because her own, you know, relationship life is is, is complicated uh, to say the least, based on you know f- you know finding her, her wife again uh, last season. But they. Uh, you know, they did this form for one of the kids, and they, they, Moira goes to the, the place, uh, and the, the woman's, like, getting the form, and she talks to the kid, and it turns out this kid's having trouble adjusting, that he actually misses Gilead. He misses the only family that he's ever known, he misses having a Martha, he, you know, the, the life that he knew was just kind of taking from, and yes, and Moira even says as much in one scene that eventually this is for the better, but this is a sudden shock. And she tries to like communicate with the kids, say it's okay to feel what you're feeling, it's okay to be angry or sad about this. And the kid kind of, you know, flies off. And um, and it's, it's a conversation she has with Rita before this as well, where Rita is still being very religious and just talking about keeping June in her prayers, things like that. Um, So not as much as the kids, but it also feels like, you know, Rita is also maybe in a transitionary period. And Moira herself has went through that. And I think that the point of this plot is that Moira, in some small ways, is still going through that, which is to say that she, you know, she blows off dinner with a girlfriend because she neglected her work uh, doing the fundraiser stuff, and Emily sort of offers, hey, go and have dinner, it's okay, and she's like, no, no, I'm going to do my work. And it's after she goes to see the kid, and they're talking about how, how much trouble the kid's going through and how it's awful, and this scene's actually probably the, one of the best scenes of, the, of this whole plot, this subplot, because... There's two key things that happen in this scene. One is the discussion of that ties into the, the, the little arc that I'm talking about with Moira, which is she's saying that she kind of revolves around cleaning up June's mess and sort of says, yeah, June takes the big you know gestures, she, she takes the big swings, but then doesn't think about the details and the fact that all these kids are actually going to kind of hate that they're in a new place and not understand why they've been taken from their homes and not understand that this is better in the long run and how awful the world they were in was. You know, they, you know, they were they were children and they were being indoctrinated and all these things. And that ties into Moira's plot because Moira's whole thing in this episode is she recognizes this kid has not been able to move on and the, the solution to it later, of course, is as Rita comes over and essentially acts as a Martha again, you know, in, in a sort of small way to help the kid kind of adjust, uses a couple of Gilead phrases with him and it's kind of this transitionary thing. And this encourages Moira in her final scene of the episode to go and surprise a girlfriend with dinner. And it's kind of like a an, an opportune moment because it turns out her girlfriend's leaving on business or something for a week. But you know, they have a you know a nice quick dinner while she's waiting for her car uh on on the stairs and it's just this kind of you know, it's it's all about Moira making the choice to not still be stuck in Gilead like this kid is. That she's been cool enough, she can make the conscious choice to not be held prisoner by the memory of Gilead anymore um and you know I, and that's what that scene you know there's so many things in this scene this conversation between Moira and Emily sort of poke at between outright saying you know June creates these messes and she loves June but goddamn, like I'm still cleaning up her messes but also just them talking about how like they're complaining and they kind of admit are we awful people because we're kind of complaining about the situation we're in when June's still in Gilead and all these things are still going on and happening to all these people you know should we feel guilty that we can have happiness and freedom and and do what we want and have a new romantic life and and so on and so on and it just it felt like there was a lot of interesting questions being asked here where it is a complex situation for them to deal with like the magnitude of it is so huge they can't necessarily always just feel guilty about it. They they kind of have to get on with things at some point. And, you know, Moira seeing this kid, seeing Rita struggle, and almost finding them each other, you know, letting them find each other so they can kind of grow gradually from what they were doing before. And she kind of realizes that cleaning up after what June's doing is kind of how she's been sort of staying in t- And not that she's going to stop doing that. She's still going to obviously do her job and help because she's committed to this, but she's recognizing that she should also move on and should do these other things for herself. And I thought that, I thought that was a neat, a neat scene. Uh, 
because of that. Um, yeah, so... I said there was two things, and there was two things in there. I just kind of muddled them together. The, one was uh, the, 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 the June being the, the thing that she's latching on to to stop moving on, and then the other one was the conversation between... Uh, and that same conversation with Moira and Emily about feeling guilty and about like how they're complaining about things and how difficult it is for them despite the fact that you know june's doing all these other things and the funny thing is though as a viewer of the show the, the stuff in canada is actually a little bit more interesting <laughs> because it's new because it's advancing things forward and seeing a kid seeing a child who has been thus far raised in gilead like struggling with the food that's being served to him uh, struggling with you know all, all the changes is actually a, a new interesting like piece of the puzzle a, a piece that we've not gotten to yet and it's almost kind of mirroring i think at least how i think some of the audience certainly how i feel sometimes where the stuff in gilead's almost a little low tat at this point you know we've had three plus seasons of it now and like there's always so much you can keep shocking is the more interesting thing is how do you like get a kid through this transition or how do these various characters all deal with like living in this new place and and go because it's one thing you know Luke was a character who was only in flashbacks for so long until we found out he got out but it's all a bit different for some of these other characters Moira was the the big one where we didn't know her in Gilead first and then she got out and then Emily as well and now Rhea and it, we're sort of going through this and how they're all they've all kind of reacted a little bit differently and they've all transitioned to freedom a little bit differently um. I think all that stuff is interesting and in, in taking it to places... Like, even look at the start of the episode when he's, like, introducing Rita and he's talking about June and he's, like, tearing up as he's talking about everything that his wife's doing in Gilead to, like, save people and fight back and all the rest of it. Um, You know, for him, this idea that, you know, June has... And it's... Obviously, it's always been on the, 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 the pretense of, like, staying to try and in some way save their daughter, but... This idea that in, she, she's had multiple chances now to get out, and every time she's chosen to stay because she would rather fight and be with him. And, you know, that that plays into some of the stuff we've spoken about before, about how Gilead has changed her so much. And there's a lot of talk of, of that in this episode as well, about how Gilead brings the worst out in most people. And June somehow, in, in some ways, it's brought the best out in her, although arguably also the worst in some cases too, because it's having to turn her into a killer in order to survive, but she is becoming this this freedom fighter or whatever. And you look at some of these other characters, because I, I, I did kind of like how those conversations happened in Canada, but then when June talks to Esther at one point, because Esther says, you know, I don't think there's any good men left in, in Gilead, and June says, no, there still is. There's good men everywhere. But, you know, Gilead makes it very hard to, to be good. And it felt like thematically, the, the phrasing wasn't exactly the same, but the, both scenes were essentially saying this, the same thing, is that the world that they're in uh, is, is more challenging. It makes it tougher for everyone to be good and recognize when someone is being good uh, and how that skews perceptions. So... There is some good stuff in this episode, as, as far as like the, the themes of the different plots kind of overlapping in, in a, a smart little way, which I, I do appreciate. It makes it feel a little bit more, uh, not only layered, but like, the layers are living together. The, the layers are part of the same cake. Uh, uh, this is a horrible analogy, but um, yes, there, there was an idea. In it. But yeah, you know, the idea that you know June has had to change so much that Maybe June, you know, it's just in the same way that a prisoner, like, some prisoners, like, almost fear being free again. They fear being on the outside because they're so used to prison life after, you know, 10, 20 years in, in prison. Uh, you know, is it kind of the same thing with June, where, she, like, the thought of being free and the, the thought, as much as it's in theory, obviously, what she wants, there is part of, like, have I changed too much to be a part of that world now? Has the monster that I have I have become in this world to survive... Do I want that monster to meet Luke? Do I want Luke to see that version of me? Do I do I want these other people to see that version of me? And obviously what we're seeing in Canada is all these other characters make this transition where they're coming to the terms with what they are they are with what they've been in Gilead and you know just the the, the shared trauma that they're all kind of trying to work through and uh I, all I'm really trying to say here I guess is that there's a lot of nuance in exploring 
this as a as a concept. Uh, the, the, in particular, the refugee side of this, which obviously the show's been poking at since season one in some way or another, but because we have so many characters now who have made that trip, it's like, okay, now, now we can really get into the meat of it. And uh, that stuff is super interesting. And it is, generally speaking, I'd say a lot fresher feeling than the stuff that's going on in Gilead with June. Um, although there are some very good scenes in there in this episode too. So, uh, there you go. Now there's my uh, my thoughts on on episode two of of Handmaid's Tale season four. Uh, let me know what you thought of this one in the comments below. Like and subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, get us on the Twitters at mail underscore fuzz for channel updates. If you want to support the channel and the content and everything we do, you can head over to patreon.com slash TV for as little as one dollar per month, and you can get some bonuses for your trouble. But uh, mostly just you know support all the content. Uh, but like and subscribing, all that stuff does do that as well. So uh, if you want to do it for free, just hit those buttons. Just hit, hit the pound them, pound and smash, and the, the, the obliterate the, the like button. I don't know. Uh, I hate shelling. I hate shelling like a YouTuber, but it's a necessary evil, unfortunately. Uh, here we are. So thank you once again for watching and listening. I always appreciate it. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?